Good morning. Making sure I'm good on my end. Good on my end. Welcome and good morning, Hope Hopewell Church. I am um, delighted to be with you. Um, normally, I'm delighted to be with you and extra today because uh, God brought you here safely in the midst of the snow, and it's, it's fun to have some of that. Uh, I wanted to start off today with this scripture. Uh, Colossians 3.15 says this, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, in one body, and be thankful. Let the word, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the line. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, and singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with, thank, with thankfulness in your hearts towards God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, and everything, do, it, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Just a good reminder this morning of why we're here and what we're about. Ooh, if I can, I'll work on that. We'll get, we'll get more polished for next week. Um, a, for announcements, a couple things. First, we our prayer focus this month is, is Hudson United Brethren Church. And uh, Donna Grace haven't been here as much lately because they've been helping serve there. Uh, I know uh, their pastor got sick, so they went up in pulpit filled for a little bit. And uh, be praying for them. Two of their lay leaders are seriously ill, both with cancer. And I'll just tell you, I mean, a, a, a churches churches can be made or sorry, churches are made or break, made or made or broken, make or, break. make or break. Why can't I spit it out? I'm gonna go drink some more caffeine during worship. Uh, churches really need good lay leadership, and for them to have two of their key leaders down, that's a, that's a that's a struggle for them. And so we want to see God raise up, you know, bring healing and raise up the next generation of leaders for them, and they can continue on in ministry. Also, for fellowship opportunities, there's two things coming up. One, a Euchre tournament. So it's uh, sign up back there. This is your last chance to do that. Christmas party is also next week. So uh, we're going to have some snow for it. But bring your white elephant gifts. I am particularly excited about the gift we are bringing. I think it's going to be a, a hit. Uh, literally, it's going to be a hit. Uh, so it'll be fun. And uh, also women's ministry, it's fun to have Carrie Slager healthy enough again to, to really as, uh, resume the role and take up the role of leading women's ministry. So she's got a couple of uh, things in the bulletin, a kickoff event and a Bible study. So please check those out. And then if you want to help hold some babies in the nursery, uh, Lizzie would take you. The last thing that I want to point, uh, make a note of today is that, uh, as you know, this year is the year of outreach. We're not setting aside prayer. We're going to try and continue to juggle and improve on our prayer life while also asking the question, how does God want us to reach out beyond ourselves? And one of the things that we are doing, which I mentioned to you already, is we are partnering with the UB Global. It's the global missions arm of the United Brethren Church, which we are United Brethren. And uh, they do a consultation for churches to help them identify how to reach out to their communities. And part of that process that we're going to go with them, we're going to do with them in February, is the church people in the church filling out a survey and it's then they got to get some data they want to get the lay of the landscape of of how we're currently engaged where we're currently at um, as congregants so it's it's in the bulletin that's that insert it's going to be up on the screens you'll get email links but please it's not that long please this week or next take some time to fill that out so that we can help have some discernment right you're going to really help us as a church leadership get some discernment on where to go forward so please have some input that way uh, that's all that i have for announcements Elder James, would you come up and lead us in a word of prayer? Good morning, everyone. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for bringing us all here this morning. Uh, if we'd like to lift up uh, the, the Hudson United Brethren Church, that they're just going through a lot of uh, turmoil right now and, and a lot of health issues. Um, lay your healing hand on that on that church and just give them guidance and uh, and your steady hand uh, right now uh, thank you for bringing us here together this morning um, I love snow but uh, but it doesn't make it easier to drive so thank you for getting us all here safe um, the people that didn't uh, make it here just keep them safe at home and and uh, um, be with them uh, thank you for uh, being the ultimate father thank you for um, Abraham's promise that, that uh, the promise that you've passed down to us um, to provide for us and uh, just help us to to focus every day and to honor you in your name amen good morning how are you guys doing good yeah it is snowing out there hey will you guys stand with me as we 
uh, get ready to worship God. And hey, if you're joining us online, welcome. Nice to see you guys too. And uh, what I want to encourage you with this morning, whether uh, you would rather be at home drinking some cocoa or whether you are at home drinking cocoa, whatever it is, hey, I just encourage you to take this moment as we get ready to worship God, as we get ready to ascribe value and honor to Him, as we get ready to respond to who He is and what He has done for us, as we remember the great things that He's done for us, remember the promises that He's made to us, will you, will you take this time, will you take this moment and place the focus on Him? Will you lift your voices to Him and not worry about maybe what your neighbors are thinking, but just remember what God is thinking, what He's thinking about you and how much He loves you. And how there are so many reasons for us to love Him. There's so many reasons for us to celebrate Him, to praise Him. And so this morning, Hopewell, let's, let's be a powerful uh, a group. Let's be a powerful community of people that respond to God. A powerful community that worships God. A powerful community that loves Him. So let's do that together this morning. Great things. You have 
Well, there are so many reasons to love Jesus. There's so many reasons to love our God. But we gotta remember that it's not because we loved him, it's because he loved us. So this morning, let us sing out how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. turned his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him Till it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why
Heavenly Father, we thank you for paying our ransom. God, we thank you for your love, for your graciousness, for your goodness, for your kindness. God, we thank you for the great things that you have done, that you are doing right now, and that you will do. God, you, there are so many reasons to love you. And so we sing out that you are the anthem of our heart. Let nothing else be the anthem. Let nothing else be the thing that we hold above you. God, we pray as we worship you and as we hear from your word that we would become dependent, more and more dependent upon you, that we would have faith that you want to do great things in us for your kingdom, for your glory, and for the other people in our world. Lord, we give you everything. It's your name we pray. Amen. Amen, church family. Hey, will you turn to someone next to you and wish them a good morning and a Excellent. <laughs>
and says, is that all that the cross can do? When we are unfaithful in following Christ, when we fall away during the hard times or times of persecution, it, we say, man, the cross is powerless, the cross is weak. And that's the challenge for us to be prepared for persecution so that we can live a life that can withstand that, so that the cross is powerful and God gets glory. And so how do we withstand persecution? And we spent the last couple weeks talking about this theme of maturity, right? God wants us to become mature believers, grounded, stable, so that we can withstand persecution, thus help make God look incredible, make God look awesome, make the cross look powerful. And the way we know that we're mature is if we're producing fruit, right? The assurance of salvation, the result of maturity is fruit produ production. And again, this is recapping the last couple sermons, specifically last week. And so last week, we talked about this need to endure, the need to not be sluggish, the need to produce fruit that God calls each and every one of us to. And then God follows that up in the book of Hebrews. What we're going to hone in on today is that if we can endure with faith and patience, producing fruit, God is going to bless us. He's going to bless us, brothers and sisters. And, it, and every price we pay will be worth it. Picking up our cross to follow Jesus is going to be well worth it because his blessings far outweigh the cost. And we're going to, so we're going to come in today and speak about God's promises to us, where God goes next in the book of Hebrews. And I hope today that, that if you can get your mind and your hearts and your trust wrapped around these promises in a greater way, that you will find refuge in Christ and have strength and endurance to live this life that God calls us to because it's challenging. And we're still largely sheltered from persecution, and it's still challenging. But as we walk into it more, hopefully you can take strength and energy today. So let me bridge into today by recapping or by um, reading the last couple of verses from last week. Hebrews 6, 11 and 12 says this, And we desire that each one of you show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, I keep on urgency, brothers and sisters, but imitators of those who, check it, through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let's talk about the big one. It's the big promise. You know what? It's really easy for us, for a number of reasons, to dig into the New Testament and to minimize the Old Testament, right? And it's our natural inclination is to be New Testament people. But, you know, again, and this is probably a dull statement for many of you, but it's worth saying again, there's some really important things that happen in the Old Testament, right? And the, the and uh, that impacts us and shapes the New Testament. We're going to see next week when we talk about typology, the, the interplay between Old Testament and New, and they are inseparable. You cannot divide them against each other. But God does a lot of really important things in the Old Testament that sets the stage for us. And in fact, one of the chief reasons why we picked Hebrews to go through is that Hebrews is the most Old Testament of the New Testament books. And so I want to be able to weave some of this stuff in for us. Now, one of the pivotal passages in the Old Testament, believe it or not, is in, found in Genesis chapter 12. And, and, I, and I do not undersell it, or I do not overstate it when I say, this is the moment where the arc of human history changes. Uh, dead serious. Genesis 12, the arc of human history changes. A nation is begun, a promise is given, which we inherit. And in fact, a promise is given back in Genesis 12 that really summarizes what God is trying to do in and through the church. It's a promise that we inherit. And finally, we're going to hone on this promise because it's pivotal and it's the subject of Hebrews chapter 6 today. He's going to be talking about the promise we just read. He's going to be talking about Abraham's promise. And this is what we're going to see in Genesis 12. Abraham's promise. This is the Old Testament background informing the conversation today inside of our Hebrews passage. Now, let's get to Genesis chapter 12. But we're going to set the stage, right? So in Genesis, leading up to Genesis chapter 12, we have Noah in the flood. So we get Noah in the flood account and then his descendants. Then we get the Tower of Babel and then descendants coming out of the Tower of Babel. And then in the list of descendants, we get to this guy named Terah and his kids. One of those kids is named Abram. And we're told that Abram's wife, Sarai, Sarah is, bar Sarai is barren and unable to have kids. Okay, that's what we hear. List of genealogies, a little snippet about this guy named Abram and his wife. And now look at what God says to this dude named Abram. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great 
nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'm not good. And I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you or through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord told him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was, Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. This is a big deal. This is a big promise. Let me just highlight a couple things that God specifically says to Abram, who later becomes Abraham, had many sons. Many sons had father Abraham. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Look at what he says to him. He says, go to the land, right? There's a promise to land. He says, I'll make you a great nation, many descendants. I will bless you. Man, that's good stuff. To be a blessing. That's pretty good. And I'm, I'm going to give you my protection and favor. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. It's like God saying, I got your back. And if anybody messes with you, messes with you they mess with me. <laughs> That's pretty big stuff, right? And then, what? In you or through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I mean, God, God is like letting human history work. He, he's, he's interacting with it, but it's like he's just interacting with the world. Then all of a sudden, he plucks this dude out of seeming obscurity and says, boom, you're my dude. You're my man. I got your back, and I'm going to do something incredible, amazing, eternal through you and your descendants. Like, history changes. Can you imagine that? You're living a kind of a normal life, and God says, you know what, Logan? You're my man. I'm going to make you a great nation, Logan. I'm going to have your back. Man, holy smokes, what a promise. What a promise. And he gives this promise to Abraham and his descendants. But always with an eye to the outside. And I just want to remind you of the, the kind of the, the history of the arc of this promise. You know, Abraham's descendants, the Jewish people, were the ones who inherited this promise. Right? Through you and through your offspring, your biological offspring, I will do this, God says, and I will bless. But he does this always with an eye to the outsider, even in the Old Testament. For instance, um, you see... Pathways, right? Rahab the prostitute. She's a, she's a Canaanite. Them's the bad guys. And she lives in Jericho, which you know what happens to that city. And the spies go, and Rahab shelters them, and she lets them escape from the city. And the spies arrange so that she and her family are protected. And so the walls come tumbling down. Everybody gets slaughtered except for Rahab. And Rahab becomes a Jew. She becomes part of the nation. In fact, she, we see her showing up in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1, 5. Right? So here's this prostitute, part of the enemy, becomes part of the descendant of Jesus, the ancestry of Jesus. How cool is that? God always had an eye for the outsider. But again, but you had to come in and become a Jew to do it. This promise was for the Jews and those who would convert to Judaism until Jesus comes in the cross. And then he opens that sucker wide. And he says, now you no longer have to be a Jew to inherit the promise. Look at what is said in Ephesians 3, 6. This, is the, this mystery is that the Gentiles, that'd be you and I, are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. It is a mystery, and it was amazing for them. When the cross comes, and it no longer is about a descendant from Abraham. It's no longer about becoming culturally a Jew. It is now opened up to everybody across every tribe, tongue, and nation because of what Jesus does on the cross. And that's an amazing promise. And I say that, and I point this out, because, brothers and sisters, we get to inherit this Genesis 12 promise. What God said thousands of years ago to Abraham is being fulfilled now through us, the church. This big promise of land. Brothers and sisters, we get to inherit the promised land. We get to inherit heaven. When God remakes the earth into perfection, we get to inherit that. I'll make you into a great nation. We are the great nation. We are the nation that's so big it transcends every border, every tongue, every tribe. Our nation, the spiritual nation of Christ, transcends everything. The most powerful force in the world gets to be the church. We are blessed by God so that we can be a blessing. We have God's protection and favor. God's got our back. There's no playground bully that wants to mess with us anymore when they see a God like ours behind us watching our back. And through us, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is a big promise. Again, it shapes the future of the church. It tells us what God's doing here. It's the one that's highlighted in the text in Hebrews today. So that's, I want to make sure we kind of get our minds around that. But I want to remind you that God makes many other promises to us as well, doesn't he? There's many other promises made, but this is a big one. 
And so today in our passage of Hebrews, we're going to see four kind of principles of God's promise. And we're going to weave this passage into Abraham's story, again, because he's the subject of the text. So let's get into the first of the four principles of God's promises. First, that God gives his promises to ordinary people. The first principle is that God gives his promise to ordinary people. Let me show you this. Hebrews 6.13, God says this, For when God made a promise to Abraham... Since he had no one greater to whom, to whom to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. This is how we know he's talking about this Genesis 12 promise. Right? This is, hey, point back to Genesis 12. And this is really a simple idea that I want to convey to you. Right? What do we know about Abraham or Abram before God picks him out? Really, we don't know very much about him. Right? We know his genealogy. We know who his ancestors are. But he didn't, he didn't seem to be a particularly blessed or godly guy. Let me tell you what I mean. He's 75 years old and doesn't have any kids. Now, he might be prosperous in terms of number of goats and servants, but he didn't have any kids. And back in that day, you're not wealthy unless you have kids and a family, right? They actually invert our priorities. We, hey, you're wealthy if you have stuff in America and experiences and financial freedom and blah, 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 like that's wealth. And we say kids actually are a hindrance to that, which is why, you know, modern, right? They say, no, it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you have no kids, no descendants, then you, everything's meaningless. You're not actually a rich person at all. He is poor in the most important sense for their culture because he has no kids. And then we see Abraham, or at least his family, they followed other gods. Check this out, Joshua 24. It says this, And Joshua said to the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah the father of Abraham, and of Nahor, and they served other gods. They served other gods. God gives this promise to ordinary people. Let me tell you what I mean by ordinary people. I mean people that are fallen and sinful like you and I. Here's a, here's a man who is not rich in the eyes of their world, who is not following the true God, at least his family isn't to some degree. And God plucks him out and says, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to choose you and I'm going to ask you to trust in me. That's an incredible thing. It's an incredible thing. Why does God do this? Let me go on here. Right, look at this Joshua verse again, the next couple, or verse 3. Notice, then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river. And grammatically speaking, you could say, I led him through all the land of Canaan. And I made him into, made his offspring many. God plucks out ordinary people, fallen people like you and I, to do something amazing so that he can say, I took them, I led them, I made them. God gets the glory, great things he has done. This is how God wants it to be. And so I, I, I belabor this point and I go through this because I want us to remember, each and every one of us, that we inherit God's promises. Not because we deserve them, not because of some attribute of our own. So, bye bye, Emric. I love you, brother. <laughs> we inherit God's promise because God, in His grace and His kindness, chose us to give the promises to. And we simply respond in faith to His choosing. Abraham had a choice to get up and go. God calls to us. We have a choice to get up and go when he calls, don't we? That's the only thing we bring to the table is a willingness to respond. You know, as Jaden frequently reminds us, that's worship. He does it so that we ordinary people can be used by God to show God's glory. I think it's a good thing for us to remember. And the sneaky part about this too is that what this means if he chooses ordinary people to work through them so he can say, I did and I led and I made it means life's not about you and I. My life's not about me. It's about God getting the glory through my life. I withstand persecution and I'm faithful to God, not because it makes my life better so that God can get the glory. I trust in God's promises that he wants to work through me, not that my life is more enriched, but so that God gets the glory through my life because he deserves the glory. I'm, I'm grateful that he chooses ordinary people like you and I. The second principle of the promise is this. God often takes longer than we'd like to fulfill his promises. God often takes life. Let me, let's, you see it here in verse 15. And thus Abraham, having waited, waited patiently, obtained the promises. Now let me unpack and just remind you of what waiting patiently looked like for Abraham and see if that huh, challenges your idea of patience of mine. Because it, it definitely challenged mine this week when I kind of remembered 
What does patiently waiting mean here in the illustration? Here's, here's Abraham's timeline. He's 75 years old. He's called to receive God's promises at age 75. 25 years later, Isaac's born. Hey, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a great nation. And 25 years later, you get one kid from the promise. He's got another one, not of the promise. Shenanigans happen. Um, lack of faith was demonstrated. But Isaac's born 25 years later. About 15 years after that, God calls Abraham to give up Isaac and to sacrifice him. Abraham is tested. We're going to unpack that in a little bit. And then at age 175, Abraham passes. A hundred years after he is promised, he passes. And you know what his family line is right now? I got Isaac, the son of the promise. How has God, Isaac's got a wife. They don't have any kids yet. That's the best, you know, but holy smokes. I have, I've lived a life, a hundred years later, from getting a promise, I have a kid who's married. He don't got no kids yet. Boy, this is the whole nation thing has really gone well for me, hasn't it? Can you imagine? I mean, Abraham is a flawed human being, right? He is not perfect by any means. But he held on to the promises. Can you imagine getting a promise from God? Your earliest memory, and you live a hundred years, and you just see barely the glimpse of God fulfilling that promise? Your entire life. And you get just a glimpse of him fulfilling that. That's a long time to wait, honestly, for what seems like a little result. And it's not just Abraham who, who demonstrates this kind of patience. It's the nation of Israel. I mean, there's multiple generations of people between Abraham and they becoming a, them, Israel becoming a nation. 430 years between when Abraham receives the promise and when Israel becomes a nation. And they define Israel becoming a nation three months after leaving Egypt when they received the law from God. God meets them and says, this is what your nation, this is your um, constitution. This is what, how you become a nation. This is what it means to be an Israelite. 430 years, which means there are generations of human beings that lived saying our ancestor got a promise to become a nation and they lived their entire lives and their role in history was to steward the promise and pass it on to the next generation but never to see it fulfilled. Boy, that challenges me. That speaks to something deep inside of me. To say God often takes longer to fulfill his promise than we would like. I'll tell you why I, struggle, why I struggle with this, why it speaks to something deep inside of me. Because we live, and I live in an instant culture. Everything I want, I want quickly. Amazon Prime, give me that two-day shipping. It's not on Amazon Prime, I have to wait a week for it? Boo. If I can't afford what I want, we take out debt for it, right? That's what Americans do. We take out debt. I want, to, I, want my, I want my promotions to come quickly. I want to move up the ladder quickly. I want everything to have a quick fix. We have Instapots. And it's not the type of pot you're often thinking about for quick meals. Thanks, thanks, Tim. The police officer caught that one in. All right. Uh, we want fast. Wait, that was kind of funny, really. I mean, I know this is the joke because you never laughed at my jokes, but I'll say it again. We want Instapots for quick fixes, but it's not the kind of pot you're thinking about. <laughs> Maybe I spoke it too fast. Jaden's coaching me in the middle of the week, trying to give me some tips, and it's not working. <laughs> All right. Um, he did not approve that a joke, by the way. That's a lie. He would, he would, uh, we want fast weight loss solutions. You know, I mean, we, everything we want, we want it quick, right? I remember complaining to my grandma one time about how long the microwave took to cook, and she looked at me, and her jaw just dropped. Because she's like, she grew up making everything on a stove, you know, before microwaves. Like, it takes so long to heat up my water. It takes 30 seconds, you know. My point is, we live in an instant culture. I live in an instant culture. And to realize that God isn't beholden to my timelines, that God gives things and he makes us wait. He gives you promises that you have to wait for and wait for days or weeks or months or years or, dare I say, lifetimes. God's kind of smart. And we know this principle of kids and we kind of forget it as adults. It is not good for my kids to get what they want when they want it. The virtue of patience is an important one to instill upon the next generation. And it is one that God instills in us. But I don't like it. 
God's not about quick fixes because we live in an instant culture. The second truth of this is that we live in a self-centered culture. This is some of my, here, here's my, my work at a more poetic language. The broader Western culture has stoked the fires of our natural self-interest into a raging inferno, willing to consume anything in its path for the sake of feeding itself. Our self-interest is stoked into a raging forest fire, raging fire, willing to consume anything in its path to feed itself. We live in an incredibly self-centered culture. Marriage is about making the individual satisfied, and if your marriage now inconveniences you or your partner holds you back somehow, then you get out of the way. You get out of the marriage. Kids are now seen as a way to bring satisfaction to adults. We use kids for our own self-interest as a culture instead of living our lives for our kids and say, my life no longer is about me, it's about this little kid that now I steward. My wife's a veterinarian, and she notes the difference, right, even the last 10, 15 years around here. She said, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when she was working in veterinary medicine, um, you know, people arrived on time, they were grateful, they paid their bills, they understood what's going on for a veterinarian, they had a little bit of under, you know, life wasn't all about them. Now she's like, I have so many clients that show up 45 minutes early, 45 minutes late, hardly pay their bills, but they come with the Starbucks coffee, they're mad at you when you don't accommodate them at the drop of a hat. She had a, a client get mad at her, blew up at her, and went off on her because he arrived 45 minutes early to an appointment, and she didn't see him until the appointment time. And he's honked off. She's like, what's going on? The point is, we can see this, right? We can see this trend increasing more and more, where life is about what we want and about myself. It, my point is that God makes a lot of promises to humanity. God makes a lot of promises to the church, and he makes big promises. Promises so big that they will not happen in our lifetime. Because it's not about you. It's not about me all the time. It's about something bigger than myself. It's about leaving that legacy and building something that's larger than you or I. About building the church and letting it pass to another generation. My point is, maybe we're a generation that's meant to steward the promises for the next generation. We always are. But maybe that's our lot in life. Maybe, and this is not a prophetic thing, maybe, maybe we won't see the revival of America in our lifetime. Maybe we won't see the church explode in the West in our lifetime. But maybe our job is to be faithful and to steward the promise of God's work in the world for the next generation. Maybe God won't return and the second coming won't happen in your eyes' lifetime. But maybe our job is to be faithful and to steward it so that the next generation or a hundred generations from now, they inherit the promises of God and they get to see the return. Again, not saying, I think it might be. Uh, one of the great examples of this is missionaries. I remember hearing some missionaries some years ago, you know, they go to a tribal people who have no written language. And so they spend years, nearly a lifetime of work, simply taking uh, tribal people who have no written language, giving them a written language, and then translating some of the scriptures. Right? You, you imagine your life work is create language, give them some of the scriptures. That's it. You might not see the revival happen among those people, but you are pre you're stewarding God's promises and spending your life on a mission that's bigger than you, that's not about you, and you don't see the fulfillment of it maybe even in your lifetime. You see some tangible results, but man, I think that's amazing. They do this, and then we, we need to remember this because God wants to do things bigger than you or I. And thus, Abraham, having waited, patiently obtained the promise. We are tasked with waiting patiently. As one scholar said, since faith must wait so long for its reward, the believer may be sorely tempted to grow weary and lose heart. You ever feel that way? The wait cannot be shortened, but hope can be revived by a reminder that hope in God will never be disappointed. That's a good reminder. It's easy to get discouraged as we wait, but hope can be revived as you remember that hope in God will never be disappointed. Um, I got a savings bond up here. It's a $100 one. Come on, come on. Okay. Pot jokes don't work. Even a little bit of humorous body language doesn't work. Okay. A uh, $100 savings bond. Oops, don't even try anymore. It's, um, uh, my grandma gave this to me when I was young. You know, I had a couple of grandparents and a couple sets of grandparents. And one grandparent, he'd give you cash. You know, as a 10-year-old, like, hey, 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 I got a $50 bill. 
And my other grandma, she got me a savings bond. <laughs> savings bond. I, look, I'm 36, and I still ain't old enough yet to cash all these suckers in. I've been saving these for a long time. To be honest, I didn't really value it in the moment when I realized I, I can't cash this. I gotta wait 20 plus years to cash this sucker in. 30 years cash this in. <laughs> that was kind of a letdown. But it's a long term benefit, isn't it? A savings bond is, is a promise. I've given you a little bit now, right? I'm giving you this now, that it will be worth much more later. Much more later. Value in waiting, savings bond. You know, having a savings bond helps cultivate the virtue of patience. Uh, I can tell you what I did with my, the $50, $50 my one grandpa gave me in cash. It got blown on really stupid stuff. But now I'm, you know, I've learned a little bit. I've matured a little bit. So I'm going to go blow this on something better, like, like better Lego sets. I got one. All right. All right. The sermon's done. I got to laugh. We're okay. No. Look, the point is that God doesn't pay out like we want. God's promises are like savings bonds. He gives you this. Says, hold on to it, steward it, don't forget it, don't trash it, don't lose it, don't walk away from it, because I will pay out. And the patience required between time of reset, receiving the promise and paying out of the promise cultivates our character, helps us to learn and grow. You are a better human being because God doesn't fulfill his promises when you want him to, when you want him to fulfill them. Third. God, aff God affirms his promises after trials and tests. Verse, let me show you what this is. Verse 16. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final confirmation. The, the oath here is a key word. We're going to unpack that. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, both his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. I just want to note here, I just want to remind you, like this, this passage is covered in grace and just an indicator of God's grace. Um, it's a concession to our human weakness that God even makes promises and oaths to us to begin with. I mean, if you think about it, God is true and trustworthy and everything he says will come true. He doesn't need to promise us anything if he says it will happen. It's a concession to us because we live in a fallen world. It's an act of grace because we are a mistrusting people living among a bunch of mistrusting people. And it's really good for us to get promises, oaths, or guarantees, right? Like I'm not going to sign something or I'm, you know, if I'm going to invest money, I want to guarantee, right? God keeps his word each and every time. I just want to remind you of that simple truth. So it's God's grace to even make us promises and oaths to begin with. But he's talking about an oath here. Let me, let me remind you kind of timeline of God's interactions with Abraham. He makes the promise of Genesis 12 when Abraham's 70. Five. And then he, reiter he says that promise to him a little bit later. And then when Abraham uh, turns 15, you know, he says, go sacrifice Abraham, or go sacrifice Isaac on the altar. And he goes. And when, when he's passed that test of faith, God says, let me reiterate my promise to you, and I'll add my oath to it. So when it's talking about God showing more convincingly his promises by adding an oath, he's talking about what God says to Abraham after Abraham passed the test of faith of offering his son Isaac. Look at, look at look how Hebrew 11 actually talks about this interaction with the sacrifice of Isaac. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, go offer your son Isaac, and he who received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it is said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, Isaac, which from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive back. Abraham was tested. The point here is, Abraham was tested. Do you really believe, did he really believe that God will fulfill his word? Did you really trust God? So, look, sometimes God brings us to spots where we have no idea how he's going to work things out. Can you imagine Isaac like, hey, go offer your, Abraham. Imagine him saying, go offer your promise on Isaac on the altar. You think, how is God going to work this out? I have no clue, but I'm going to trust God. Because he's going to fulfill his word. And you can see Abraham believed that, hey, God, God over living in the dead. He'll just bring Isaac back from the dead and continue his promise. Abraham passed the test of faith, and he got a reiteration of God's promise. And in fact, God says, now I'm going to add my oath to it so that you understand and you can really hold firmly to the fact that you are chosen, that I have promised you. 
let me bridge that to us. We're going to be tested a lot in life. Your faith in God's promises will be tested. And you will be brought to spots where you're not sure how God's going to work out the fulfillment of his promise through your life. But you need to make the choice to trust. To trust in God instead of the world. Do you trust in God instead of your heart? Do you trust in God other than the, your favorite news site? Do you trust in God other than your favorite podcaster, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? But if you pass that test of faith, God's going to reaffirm his promises to you. Why? Look at this. This is a key verse. He does this so that we who have fled to God for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We fled to God for refuge. Because we know the promises of the world are dross. They're valueless. They're not eternal. They're empty. So we go to God for refuge, and he gonna reiter he's going to reiterate his promises to us and reaffirm them so that we have encouragement to hold fast and not give up to that hope set before us. Um, illustrating this point, uh, I, I knew that God called me to ministry. It's kind of like a promise between me and God. God's like, hey, you'll be my man. I'm going to call you to ministry, and I'm going to be with you every step of the way. Right? It's kind of baked into the cake of a call to ministry. And so I, I, I knew God promised to work through my life that way. And then, man, you know, ministry is not always easy. And there was a time when ministry got real, real tough. And I stepped back and say, and I, you know, step out of ministry for a year. And say, man, is this God? Is this what you want for me? And I questioned that call for a little bit. And I, no, God, in fact, has called me to ministry. And in fact, I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to trust that you're going to use my life in that way. And you get back in the game and you do it. And God reaffirms that initial promise, that initial call. He reaffirms it, makes it stronger. And, you know, being here with you guys, seeing what God's doing in Hopewell, through Hopewell, is reaffirming to me that God, in fact, has indeed called me to this. I ain't killed the church yet, and that's pretty nice. You are going to get tested. You're going to get the snot beat out of you sometime. And you're going to quake down to the depths of your soul to say, is God trustworthy? Can I believe him? And my encouragement to you is, can you pass that test of faith? And you can. And if you do, God's going to reaffirm and reiterate and say, yes, yes. That's, by the way, one of the unique things that uh, those who have walked with Christ faithfully for a long time get that us young bucks don't, is they get to have a lot of testimony to say, look how God has reaffirmed time and time again his faithfulness. And so if you, you want to hear some cool stories about how God has reaffirmed his faithfulness, after times of trials and testing, go find somebody with gray hair or no hair and ask them. All right. Maybe that was too insulting. All right. Principle four. God always keeps his promises. Verse 19. Here we go. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters, in, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Um, God is ending this with some encouragement, and I just want to tell you that we are privileged to have our place in history. Um, look, when we, God makes promises like to Abraham, it's a, it's a yet to be fulfilled. In the arc of human history, they're on the cutting edge, right? They don't see a lot of what's behind them, and they have to hope for a lot of what's going to come before them. We are 2,000 years removed. We have seen how God is faithful in fulfilling his promise to Abraham. We have seen how God has preserved the Jewish nation and fulfilled that. We have seen how God has fulfilled the Old Testament through Jesus on the cross. We'll talk more about that next week. We have seen how God has been faithful to fulfill his promises through the church for 2,000 years. We are privileged and honored to live in this time and place in human history. We have plenty of opportunities to have confidence and trust in God's promises. We've got a lot of history behind us. Let me look at a couple of specific things he says here. First, you notice he talks about the anchor of the soul. And that's tying back to early on in Hebrews. We talked, right, about, about being anchored so that we're not pulled away, right, by the drifts and the currents of the culture and the world, lest you drift away. So he wants to be an anchor of the soul. And in fact, uh, you know, the cross was not originally the supreme symbol for the church, right? When you think about Christianity, you think about a cross. That's why it's up behind there. Let me read to you this from uh, Clement of Alexandria, who was an outstanding teacher in the early church. And look at, look at what he says. Um, and let our seals, specifically a ring or our symbols, be either a dove or a fish or a ship's anchor. Isn't that interesting? 
But one of the, you know, there are a couple different symbols that were often put forward for the other church, and this ship's anchor was one of them, because he's an anchor to our soul. And that means something to us, right? That God always keeps his promises. And that's a truth that can hold you firmly and strongly. Where are you going to drop your anchor? And are you dropping an anchor that's stable enough and secure enough to keep you from getting pulled away? And I want to tell you that Christ is a firm enough place for us to anchor. We have this anchor of the soul. I just want to remind you again, again that you, every, each and every one of us is looking for security. And each and every one of us is trusting in promises from somebody, aren't we? If I have this, I will be happy. If I achieve this, I will be satisfied. If I do this, I will have peace. None of those promises are secure. That's dropping your anchor in a place where it won't bite, in a place that's not strong enough to hold you. You have a secure foundation. You have a good place to anchor. And that's in Christ. Second thing he says this, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. As we know, the inner, the inner curtain was a place where God dwells, right? Um, where do you keep your promises at? You know, where do I keep this at? This little savings bond. You know, I keep it in a safe at home. How secure is that? Not very good safe. One break in and it's lost. Our hope is set behind the curtain in God's presence where God dwells. The promises that he gives us are kept secure where God dwells. In heaven where they will not be stolen, where they will not burn in fire, where nobody can come and conquer and steal them. There's no better place for your promises to be held than in God's presence. God's holding them for you. Sorry, I'm evaluating if I want to do a, an extra minute and a half of bonus material. I'll skip that part. I'll do this part. Um, how do you utilize the promises of God? I just some come practical application here. We talk about these promises that are secure, that are stabilized, that stabilize us, that are behind the curtain. Let me tell you how to practically use them for a minute. Um, and it, it, they, it aligns very much with maturity. We talked about spiritual maturity is knowledge, discernment, obedience. Same happens here with God's promises. You got to know the promises. Right. Do you know what God promises to you? I'm speaking vaguely today, and I, we use the, Hebrew, the Genesis 12 one, because I expect you to be people that are able to understand and learn God's promises. Uh, read your Bibles, or this is a good tool that has been out there in the foyer. Uh, all these promises are riches in Christ, things that God says about us and promises to us. You've got to know them. Secondly, you've got to discern them. How do these promises inter intersect with life? This last week, I had one of those moments where I was just extra stressed, I sit down, and I just had to list out what are the things going on in my soul and in my heart that are causing anxiety, that are causing some fear, that are causing stress, and just list it off of several things. And then what do you do, right? What does God say about each of those situations? What does God say about each one of those fears? You align your concerns with God's promises. You align your stressors with God's word. And all of a sudden, I have discernment. I know how to view my life differently. I know how to view the situation differently because I trust what God says. The last step of it is obedience. I gotta live like that's actually true. I'm worried about this. God says, hey, fear not, for I am with you. I got you. I'm sovereign. Okay, I gotta give that up. I'm gonna live like God is actually in control. Last bit here that Jesus has gone on the forward in our advance. Um, we're gonna unpack this more next week, but when we look at Jesus, we see a we, he goes ahead and sets the example of faith forth. He, he's a culmination of all the Old Testament pointing to him. Jesus has gone before us, demonstrating what a life that trusts in God promises looks like. He goes on to secure it for us. And lastly, uh, he's a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Next week, you're going to hear the word Melchizedek a lot. I might shorten it to Mel, because uh, you're going to hear me say that about 87 times. Uh, you can count them. It'll be fun. Thank you. All right. The point here that Jesus, Jesus' position and title gives us assurance and confidence. And we're going to unpack that, like I said, next week. All this to say, let me wrap up today. God gives his promise, promises to us who have fled for refuge in him. And, those, and that's a real thing and a meaningful thing and something that we should grab a hold of firmly with two hands and not let be taken from us. His promises anchor us. His promises are secure. Jesus has gone ahead to demonstrate the fruits of God's promise and what that faithful life looks like. And he rules as our priest and our king to steward the promises and keep us secure in them. Brothers and sisters, I, my prayer this morning, you know, with, with uh, those who came to our early prayer meeting as we pray through this passage is, what, what would Hopewell Church be like if we were a people whose main characteristic 
were people that took God out of his word and trusted him what he said. Like, not just put words to it, not like, yeah, I trust God. But like, when rubber meets the road, when I go out there and live my life, when I make decisions about my relationship, my finances, my time, my engagement with my neighbors, the way that I work at my job, like everything in our lives keeps coming back to time and time again, I trust God what he says. Trust, trust God for what he says. We'd be a weird people. We'd be distinct people. We'd be a people that makes God look good, in which God could say, I chose them, I led them, I made them. And that's my hope and prayer for us. But too often we doubt God's word and God's promises. But it's part of what it means to be mature believers. Say, thank you. I, 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 I honor the privilege of being able to go over a few extra minutes today to present God's word to you. Hopefully it's encouraged and challenged you. Jane's going to come up, and I'm just excited about this last song. It really puts a good period to the message today. So, um, you know, again, the clear application here is will you trust in God's promises? And will you be faithful in stewarding them when he takes a lot longer than you and I would prefer to fulfill them? Will you trust? Will you trust? Well, hey, as always, this is a time of response. And so if, if you want to sit and pray and think on the promises of God or read the, read the Bible, whatever it is, I want to encourage you to do that. But if not, hey, will you stand with me as we sing this song?
you'll never let me down I put my faith in Jesus my anchor to the ground my hope and firm foundation you'll never let me down I put my faith in Jesus my anchor to the ground my hope and firm foundation you'll never let me down I put my faith in Jesus He'll never let me down. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faith. greatness. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. You're so good. Lord, we trust your promises. Lord, we believe what you say. We will follow after you. Great is your faithfulness, God. Thank you for that. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now may the God of peace who brought again our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of his eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good that you might do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, church family. Have a blessed week and trust in the promises of God.